You're joining us midway through this series where we're turning this parking area here into a workplace EV charging station and we've discovered a bit of a problem. In fact, it's quite a big problem in the shape of this cable. So we've run our mains distribution from our distribution board through our underground ducting in 16 millimeter, five core EV Ultra steel wire armored cable. But what's the problem, Gary? I don't think it's gonna be an easy task to bend this cable, bring it up through the EV tower, make off the armored gland and connect it into our C-Tech EV charger. However, this cable here seems incredibly flexible. That's because it is an incredibly flexible cable because we've converted our steel wired armored cable and connected it to this HO7 RNF heavy duty rubberized cable so we can get it through easily through the post and into the terminals. Now, some say that electricians who are installing EV pods are using this cable for the whole electrical installation. Now we used to see in HO7 RNF used extensively possibly in the entertainment industry. You see it a lot in some heavy duty industrial sites, but we don't normally think about it as a fixed installation cable. So are we wasting our time running steel wired armored cables? Should we just be using this for the whole installation? We'd be interested to get your thoughts on that about how you would think about doing that in an installation. Remember, we've already installed ducting and everything else to complete this installation. So we're gonna show you now exactly how we connected this cable to this cable including the Cat5 cable and how we made that joint. So this is a video of newness. We've got lots of new things, a new cable. We've got a new cable stripping tool. So this is the Sax uh, cable, armored cable stripping tool. Okay, that looks remarkably like something that come out of a plumber's toolbox for cutting through, say, copper pipe. Yeah, this is sure it works on the arm of the cable. It will work on pipe and plastic conduit as well. So oh. yeah, you could be right there, Gary, but uh, let's see how it gets on here. First time Ross has used this. So we're twisting slightly, going round, twisting slightly, so it goes further and further in in order to cut into the steel wire armors. Yeah. That looks pretty good to me. That's test will be when obviously the outer PVC is off. Yeah, so he's using a knife to do that. He could have actually just ran down the cable uh, by turning the tool the other way uh, and, and running down that, but uh, old habits die hard, Gary. Yeah, so one or two have broke off, so that suggests that we've got it in nice and Like I said, first time he's used it, so he's got to learn how uh, many rotations and tightening up he's got to do, but that looks pretty good to me. They're breaking off nice and easily. I'm sure people have noticed not just the lack of moisturizer on Ross's hands, but the advent calendar there in the background. Oh, yeah, we're time stamping our videos there. Yeah, we're just uh, towards the back end of last year. I'd suggest that advent calendar's gone now. Yeah, I would hope that under the Christmas tree, Ross got something to moisturize those hands. So now we're using it as a knife, aren't we? Yeah, just to remove that outer sheath, uh, just so we can see how it, uh, well it does just to uh, expose the armor. So pop that off and we're going to put this into a joint, aren't we? So what type of joint are we using? Yeah, so this is the Whisker Shark 6.8. Uh, we have looked at other variants of this a long time ago before on the channel. Uh, and, and we sort of thought it was lacking strain relief. This version has strain relief. So we'll just see how that uh, goes. This is the largest one in the range. So this can handle between 10 and 25 millimeter uh, five core armored cable. Um, so we're midway in that, so this is a 16 millimeter, as we'll see later. It's a new cable, but we'll, uh, we'll uh, tease that a little bit longer. So we're worried now, aren't we, and there's a separate video on this, about exporting the earth when we've got our pen protection in the form of the matte, aren't we? Yeah, we have, yeah. So we're, we're just uh, making sure we can't do that. We're just uh, sealing off that armor uh, with some adhesive lined heat shrink. And we've got the Mil uh, Milwaukee heat gun out there. Again, we're trying. Um, so here's our joint. So this is obviously because it copes with different sizes, we've got these insert pieces. Uh, it did take us a little while to figure out because they're coloured slightly differently in the instructions, but we did figure out you actually, as common sense would suggest, you remove the one that makes it smaller first. Um, and so what's Ross doing now, Gary? So he's marking up now how much of the uh, bedding material needs to be removed. There is not a lot of room in that joint, so you've got to be quite precise. But this is a tool I think I've seen before on the channel. You have, Gary, just under a different name. So this is the uh, this is the Wecon cable stripper uh, that we featured before. And I think uh, Doncaster Cables were so impressed with that, they did a Victor Kayam, Gary, and went out and bought some, but they've renamed it now as the EV Ultra Stripper. With that in mind, it's just a fantastic bit of kit. I'm sure you'll leave a link to the uh, video that we made on that. That's a, a good tool for this application. Yeah, so we've done that. We can see it's obviously got that inner plastic layer on as well that some uh, armored cables have. Now, so this is another first. Yeah, so we've got our colored cores, so that's quite nice. We've got, even got our green and yellow protective conductor identified. And what's the conductor we're just folding out of the way there? Yeah, so here's the data cable. So this is indeed the EV Ultra cable, but it's now in a much bigger size. 
and this is a special rare version because this was made uh, by Doncaster so they could get the BASEC approval across the range. Um, so it is now available in three phase uh, with the inbuilt data cable as well for this kind of charge installation that we've got here. And when you say rare, it was because we've now upped it to 16 millimeter squared for those conductors, aren't we? Yeah, that's it. So it's, uh, yeah, but this is a, this is a first time outing out of the Doncaster factory. Okay. And for me, it's taking your time now. There is a, an additional yellow one there you might have spotted. That is not a conductor, is it, Gordon? No, no it's just a little bit of, uh, a little bit of bedding material to obviously keep the, uh, the cable in the right shape and form factor. Unless it was a fiber optic we've just cut off that could be a heartbreaking moment it isn't so now we've got to make sure our connector is in the right form so it's a three at the top two at the bottom and it's vitally important that we lay our conductors correctly but we're on the first side so it's always the second side that's got to match this yeah there isn't really the room to to route the cable to a different connector and cross them over um, and again so this connector block comes with the the joint and it is handed, so it has to go three at the top, two at the bottom. You can't say flip it round if it was easier to have it the other way around because there's a couple of like locating pegs at the bottom that will sit within that gel joint when we get it. So Ross is going to go in with the old uh, croppers in order to strip. It's his favourite technique in order to do so. You might have also noticed that there's Allen Keys uh, heads on the, uh, the actual connector there. Something quite telling it also is that unlike the ones say where the mains um, make joints, they tend to shear off, don't they? These don't, do they? No, no, no. So it's just, yeah, it looks like uh, conventional terminals. Uh, again, the Allen key comes with it. You may prefer to use your own or you like a short Allen key, Gary. Yes, I, I love the, uh, yeah, the yeah. tightness of a short Allen key as it digs into your thumb as you're trying to get it yeah. into a nice tight connection. Check out the JCC video we made where Gary just, uh, assembles a competitive product that comes with lots of Allen bolts, which he drops all over the floor. I do, yeah. So, of course, now we're going to obviously slowly wind them down, go round, go round, go round again, because obviously we know those conductors tend to settle into their terminals. Uh, so we end up going round several times. We've made our connections now, um, obviously we're going to bring the other cable in a minute, but we're going to address um, something on top of our Cat5 cable as well, Gordon. Yeah, What's your we'll thinking behind that? that? We'll, uh, well, we'll come to that once we've done that. Uh, the next cable. We're going to bring in the uh, HO7 RNF, which is a highly flexible uh, cable. Uh, because we don't think we'd get this up to the charge point. Okay, so highly flexible, uh, it's class five conductor. So this should be easier to work with. Yeah. But of course, we're gonna be stuck with the way the conductors rotate within that flexible cable, aren't we? Yeah, you gotta uh, match them up, because again, although it is flexible, there isn't much room to cross them over to match the, uh, the order of the uh, armored cable we've just terminated. So it's a high quality uh, HO7, it's a, it's a Nexans cable. Again, remove that uh, the, the, the packing material in the middle. So we are exporting the CPC or protective conductor within the cable, aren't we? We're just not exporting that steel or armored one. And as I said earlier, that's really explained in that Matty video. Yeah, just yeah to see that. And we have actually seen people make a few people make mistakes on that where they, they go through the Matty device and then accidentally re-export the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the CPC connection uh, through the armor and then reconnect it in. Okay, this is a lot easier to work with, obviously, class five. I take it we're going to have a, a ferrule dropped on the end of these? Yeah, I just think, yeah, because it is, they are fine-stranded. Uh, it just provides, a, a, I think, a better connection. Some people might have also noticed that that Cat5 cable doesn't go much beyond the joint, so it's going to be floating around. It'll be interesting to see what we do with that towards the end. Yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of copper in this cable. I was thinking, yeah, do you have to buy a long bit of cable to remove a lot just to give a long data cable? I think it's better probably to make a joint going. We'll see that. Okay, so this one's in. Again, it, it, we can see how short those conductors are, how they're laying. It's vitally important that the preparation before it drops into the whisker gel joint. Yeah, I see Ross has swapped to his own Allen keys for this stage. Yeah, the other one broke. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. so we're tightening those down. You can see uh, a little sort of stanchion there that's actually going to sit within. So yeah. that will sit in. Now this is that bit where you've put some more heat shrink on yeah. the Cat5. So this is what I call engineer and judgment. So obviously in the cable we had the Cat5 and then another layer of insulation between the conductors itself. So I'm just putting that back to a uh, two layers of insulation. Uh, and then just heat shrunk that on. Yeah, it makes sense. You're now laying by the side of terminals that are live, aren't you? Yeah, so I just thought that's, yeah. So this is engineering judgment. Obviously, this is, uh, this is our installation. We're making all the decisions on this, but yeah, let me know what you think there below. So again, now we're taking that data cable back out uh, with the uh, flexible cable. It isn't available in an EV Ultra version. So I'm just, I've put some additional mechanical protection over the data cable. 
and then we're just heat shrinking that together with some uh, adhesive lined heat shrink um, but obviously the waterproofing on this isn't done by the gland it's done by the gel inside the, the, the box itself yeah so you can see now those two pegs uh, top and bottom they'll sit and locate themselves into position and obviously then we fold it shut if you get it right it's always that classic case that the gel actually comes out of the joint doesn't it? you find that ectoplasma i think you'd call it don't you yeah and we've uh, we, we've made this and we've been finding it ever since <laughs> uh, it's on <laughs> it's on the vice on the bench i found some by the door the other day and uh, yeah, you seem to be peeling some off the advent calendar, Gary, as you polish off the rest of the chocolates. <laughs> yeah. So this will also help hold the joint together. Obviously, it's, it's, it's holding the cable in position, but it's actually pulling the joint down as well. You've got those clips on the side that you'll need to fasten in order that we can uh, make sure we've got a waterproof joint. Just remind me the IP rating of the joint. So this is uh, 68. So yeah, so you would use it in the kind of applications where you use a traditional uh, resin poured joint. Uh, and, but we are doing this in the workshop and then we're going to run the cable after we've made the joint, which might be a little bit uh, strange for some people, but it was a freezing cold day and there's not a lot of room where we're putting this. So now we've got that very short piece of Cat5 from the EV Ultra. I noticed there's another bit on the end there. Now, what's happening now? Yeah, so I've been, I've uh, raided the CPC uh, catalog. Uh, so that's not circuit protective conductor, it's the uh, electrical distributor. Uh, and I found these end-to-end uh, -end IP68 rated Cat5 uh, joining uh, joints. Okay, so all we need to do then is make off both ends into an RJ45 connector and then we'll be able to pass it through the joint, is that right? Yeah, so it's an end-to-end -end joint, uh, put the plug on the cable. Uh, obviously, first stage, as ever on these things, is to forget to put the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the gland on the back. Uh, yeah, so there it plugs in. So yeah, there in comes yeah, the rest of the gland. Yeah, yeah, that you forgot first time. <laughs> okay. And then that's ready. Obviously, you wouldn't leave it in the ground unprotected no. because obviously water can get in that other end. So we're showing one end being made off. There's no point showing the other end. We just repeat the same process this time with an introduced piece of Cat5, Cat6 cable that we've got, yeah? Yeah, and then we're going to run that up our EV tower into the uh, EV charger. Yeah, and see why we made it now into the workshop because obviously there's not a huge amount of room in there, but we wanted to experiment with this um, gel joint, didn't we? There we go. So that's in position. So we're ready to run the flexible cable now up to our 22 kilowatt uh, EV charger. Now that connection uh, was easy inside of that whisker gel joint, but do you think it's going to replace those more traditional poured ways of doing the joint? Yeah, I think it was certainly a new way of tackling that problem, especially with the types of cable we're using. Remember, Gary, you've got to do it inside the workshop. But we'd be interested in your comments. What do you think of the whisker shark 68 gel joint? And also, what do you think about the option to use HO7 RNF flexible cables as part of a fixed installation? Would that be another viable alternative that you'd consider? The rest of the videos in this series, check them out. In the next part, we'll be connecting up our CTEC charger and running through all of the commissioning processes as well. But also check out the videos we've made about the EV block that's buried underneath us here and also the EV tower that gives you some great mounting options for EV chargers. We will look forward to those comments. Gary especially looks forward to debating the benefits of rubber cables and gel joints in the comments.